Hello and welcome to this video. My name is Professor Richard Brown. I'm using a somewhat different technique than I have in the past, um, using my phone to record this video. I talked briefly about the properties of being sound and complete. And so, uh, um, if we talk uh, in, in terms of our special symbols that we have introduced before, so the turnstile symbol, um, uh, we can say that um, means syntactic consequence, and the double turnstile means um, semantic consequence. So in this particular case, if we wanted to say that gamma uh, implies um, some sentence P, then we can use gamma here to stand for some set of uh, premises. So the premises may be uh, P1, P2, P3, etc. So these can be whatever. So for instance, um, in a typical case, this might be uh, modus ponens. So what this would tell us is that from the set uh, P horseshoe Q and also P that we can infer from that, that Q is the case. And so gamma in this case here um, would be P horseshoe Q and P, and sometimes people write that as the union of those things. So we would say that the union of P horseshoe Q um, and P. Okay, so that's in the sort of language of set theory, and we're not going to worry too much about that. But basically the idea here tells you um, that if you have P horseshoe Q, then uh, that syntactically entails that Q. And what this turnstile means um, syntactically entails What that means is that there is a proof uh, starting from P horseshoe Q and P and getting to Q. And we know that there's a proof because that's just modus ponens and that's one of our basic rules. So we've taken that as kind of our, our primitive case here. And so we know that that's gonna hold. And so what we would like to be able to show is that everything that we can prove, um, uh, everything that we can prove is also going to be something that um, is syntactically entailed. Uh, so we want to be able to show that everything we can prove is syntactically entailed, and this property right here is called soundness. Well, r roughly what it's saying is that um, all the things that we can prove are uh, things that we could semantically prove. And syntactic entailment, remember, for us it is it defined in terms of truth tables because this is a propositional logic. And so, for instance, if we take um, modus ponens and we look at the truth table for that, uh, and so uh, the truth table for modus ponens, we know how to construct it. We have P and Q and P horseshoe Q. And so we fill in these values in the normal way that we have always filled them in as so, and then compute the horseshoe function. Um, in the way that we have always done. And so if this is our premise one here, and this is our premise two here, um, sorry about that. And so if this is our premise one um, here, and if this is our premise uh, two here, then we can see that when premise one is true, and when premise two is true, then Q is true. And there are no other cases where they are both true. Um, uh, in all other three lines of our truth table, there's at least one false thing. So Q, uh, excuse me, P horseshoe Q is false, uh, P is false, or they're both false. So this right here uh, indicates that um, there's a semantic entailment. When one is true, that makes the other one true. So when P is true and P horseshoe Q is true, then Q has to be true. There's no other option, okay? So now soundness, if this were a more advanced class, we would try to prove soundness. Um, and we won't do that, but you can kind of see how it would go. It would be just taking all the rules that we have and showing that every time you apply one of the rules, uh, you only get something that ends up in semantic entailment. And we sort of just saw that with our um, uh, looking very quickly at modus ponens. So 
in modus ponens, there, there is a proof. We say that's a basic rule. We can use that rule um, to get to Q. And then when we look at the truth table, well, if the set over here is true, then Q is true. And so there is that semantic entailment. And so every use of that uh, rule will guarantee that. And um, we can see that all the other rules that we have are also going to roughly function that same way. Um, uh, and we won't go through all of the 18 rules that we have, but in class we have been careful to stop every now and again and to um, make sure that we understand how applying the rule at a syntactic level also makes sure that we preserve truth. So soundness is relatively easy, although um, requires some work to show. Uh, the other property going in the other direction, which says that if a set of sentences semantically entails some other sentence, then that set of sentences uh, syntactically entails that sentence, and that's what's called completeness. So there are many different ways of using the word complete, and um, we're not going to worry too much about the different ways that people have used them. But for us in the class that we've been dealing with, um, talking about completeness is talking about um, uh, uh, whether or not um, this property holds. So if something is a semantic consequence of some set of formula, then it's a syntactic consequence. So let's take the special case. So I'm, we're not going to prove completeness, by the way, for propositional logic. But we can at least get some idea, get some distance towards seeing why it would be true for propositional logic, for the language that we have developed. Um, and the basic idea is as follows. So let's take the limiting case where gamma is the empty set and Q, um, therefore, is some kind of tautology. So let's pick a really simple tautology um, and let's pick P wedge tilde P. So notice I'm using kind of meta variables here, and in real life I would like to use phi wedge tilde phi or alpha or something like that, but because of the book we're using, um, doesn't use those meta symbols. I'm using lowercase uh, p's and q's, um, even though that's kind of annoying. So we can look at, at this, and the reason why it's nice to write it in meta variables is because now p is any well-formed formula, and so any well-formed formula at all, no matter what, we can see that this is going to be a tautology here. And so if we just did the truth table in the normal way, there's only two terms here. Um, and the tilde sign reverses those truth values. The wedge operator tells us as long as one or the other uh, is true, the whole thing is true. And so we can see that this is indeed a tautology. Um, now that's interesting because we can kind of look at this and then we can see some interesting things. So using our definition, which we just introduced, of semantic entailment, we can see here that uh, what this is telling us is if we look at the case where P is true, so that's the first line of this truth table right here, we look at the case that P is true, um, and if we simply included a truth table, so let's look at P and also tilde P wedge uh, P, okay? So that's what we've done um, right here, but I'm just kind of making it explicit for us to focus on it. So P can have these two values, it's either true or it's false, and we know what happens when P is true, then the whole sentence comes out to be true, and if P is false, then that makes tilde P true, and so the whole sentence comes out to be true, um, no matter what P is doing. But look at the case where P is true. Well, we can see that what this is telling us is that P all by itself should syntactically entail tilde P wedge P. So the truth table, when we examine it, actually tells us straightforwardly according to our definition of semantic entailment, that there should be a semantic entailment from P to tilde P wedge P. Okay, so that's interesting. Now, look at the case where P is false. So in this particular case, um, we can see that that sentence is still true, 
And so now there's no semantic entailment there because uh, there's no true and also true, but we can easily turn this into a case where there's a semantic entailment because really, according to our definition of negation, if P is false, then tilde P has to be true. And so if we looked at tilde P, the truth table for it, um, then it's the reverse of this, so it's false and true. And we can see from this that when tilde P is true, there's a syntactic entailment, um, excuse me, a, a, a semantic entailment. We can see that there's a semantic entailment from tilde P to this thing over here. And so what this is kind of showing to us is that whether P is true or not, there should be um, a syntactic entailment to tilde P wedge P. And in fact, we can kind of see pretty easily that there is. So if we start from the premise that P, we can use the addition rule. Um, so if we start from the premise that P, we can use the addition rule and get P wedge tilde P from one by addition. And so starting from P, there is a proof of P wedge tilde P. Now, if we start from tilde P, we see there's also um, a syntactic entailment because we get tilde P wedge P. And so either one of those that we start with, um, we can see that there is, sorry, dropped my pen here. Either one we start with, either P or tilde P, we can see that there is um, a syntactic entailment straightforwardly to the, uh, to the conclusion here. And in fact, um, that enough, that's enough already for us to kind of see that if this is the case, if this is the case, that whether P is true, you get an entailment uh, syntactically, or if P is false, you can produce tilde P horseshoe P. What that looks like is that this derivation doesn't in any way depend on P. And so it looks like what this is telling us is that, well, it should just be a straightforward syntactic entailment, that tilde P wedge P, um, that that should be something that we could produce with no premises at all. And in fact, um, we know that that's something that we could produce with no premises at all. So if uh, um, we wanted to think about this in terms of a conditional statement, then we know what that really says is that P horseshoe P by material implication. So what that shows us is that we could start by assuming P for conditional proof. Use the tautology rule um, which is annoying, but our system requires that we do that. Uh, and then you could use the tautology rule again. You started off assuming P, you ended up producing P, and so you can conclude from that by conditional proof that P horseshoes P, and you can conclude from that by implication that tilde P wedge P. And so you can see that there is a, um, a proof with no premises um, which the conclusion of which is tilde P wedge P. So now we haven't gone through this in all of the details that we wanted to, but look, it looks like what we just assumed show was that if you start off assuming that the thing is a, um, a tautology, then you will be able to show that there is a proof of that thing. And so it looks like what we've been able to show is that the system is complete. Um, now, to really be able to rigorously prove this would require some extra work, and we would need something called the deduction theorem. Um, and of course, uh, we don't really want to delve too strongly into that kind of stuff. But in case there is some interest in that, um, the deduction theorem roughly says the following thing. It says that if there is an entailment from a set of sentences gamma, um, if there is an entailment from that and the union of that with some proposition normally designated as alpha, but in our system we would call it P probably because of the way that um, 
uh, the notation of our book works. So if the union, which basically may mean these two things together. So this is the language of set notation, um, but don't worry about that. So, so what this is telling us is that if there is an entailment from these things to um, uh, some proposition, then the set of sentences over here all by itself entails uh, syntactically um, that P horseshoe Q. So the deduction theorem tells you that you can, um, if you know this, then you can always take one of the premises of your argument and show that there's a, um, a conditional statement which could have been proved without that. So why is that interesting? Well, because notice that what we had just shown a second ago was that P entails um, syntactically that either P wedge tilde P. Okay, so here we have um, a syntactic entailment from P to P wedge tilde P, and we've seen how we could produce that. And so we look at the deduction theorem, and it looks like what we have here is the claim that there's the set of gamma, which is the empty set, along with P entails that. And so the deduction theorem says that we should be able to take P and move it over here and get a syntactic entailment um, from P to the horseshoe of P wedge tilde P. So that there should be a proof of that. Um, and that's good. Uh, because then we could see by using a little bit of logic on P horseshoe P wedge P um, that that's really just logically equivalent to saying there's a proof of P wedge P. So we could do that a couple ways, but one way of doing it is as follows. So we use implication, we get tilde P wedge P, uh, excuse me, P wedge tilde P. Uh, okay. Um, and now you can see here that if you used com, you're going to get tilde P wedge, tilde P wedge P, and then use associativity, tilde P wedge, tilde P wedge P, and then using the tautology rule gives you just tilde P wedge P. And so you can see that by the, the statement that P horseshoes the disjunction of P or tilde P is just the same as saying that tilde P wedge P. And so saying that there's a, a proof of this is simply saying that there's a proof of the original thing. And so the deduction theorem here allows us to connect um, the, the statements that we were saying previously uh, with what we were just doing. Because what we have just shown is that if P entails that, then there's just an entailment from nothing to that. Uh, and of course, we could do the same thing by showing that if tilde P syntactically entails, or I guess, you know, uh, to be a stickler, we should say proves or something like that, but you know, entails is kind of a semantic notion, so maybe there'll be some people who object to that. But for us, um, at this beginning level, I don't think it's too terrible to say syntactically uh, entails, although really we should say tilde P proves um, that tilde P, what? <coughs> <coughs> that tilde P wedge P. And of course, what that shows us is that we should be able, by the deduction theorem, to show that um, that we can prove that tilde P horseshoes tilde P wedge P. And I think you can see pretty straightforwardly um, that this thing right here, basically, uh, by some steps, is just going to show us that we can prove that tilde P wedge P. So now the two of these together show us that um, there's always gonna be a syntactic entailment. And of course, the we didn't do this rigorously because we were talking about kind of an example um, pro, uh, um, tautology. So we started off by saying, look, let's take some tautology P wedge tilde P. Uh, and where at least this is general enough that this could be A wedge tilde A, or it could be A horseshoe B wedge tilde A horseshoe B. Um, so it could be any of a number of statements, but it still is kind of an example. And we haven't, there are all kinds of other tautologies. Um, and so we would need to go through all the kinds of different cases showing that we could do this same procedure. But at least I think you can see from what we have said that the procedure could be done. And so the language that we have at this point, propositional logic, is complete, and it's also sound. And so what that means for us 
is that if we have a set of sentences which can prove um, some other proposition that um, uh, then we know that that's the case if and only if um, that set of sentences semantically can produce that entailment. And so this tells us that it is sound and complete. So propositional logic is a sound and complete logic, uh, sound and complete language, and therefore what we know is that all and only the things which are true or valid or tautologous, or depending on how you want to state that, only those things and all of those things can be proved with our system. Now at that point, um, we have a, a, a structure that we can then take as a core, and we can think about trying to add things to it. And so classical logic uh, has as its kind of kernel um, at, its, at its core, it has this kind of notion of propositional logic, truth functional logic. And then you can take that, that language, PL, which has all of those elements that we've just been talking about, and then you can add various things to it. Um, and typically the things that you add to it are going to be non-truth functional. And so, for instance, one thing that you could do is um, to add uh, uh, other kinds of operators. And so in class, we're going to explore predicate logic, which introduces quantifiers um, of a specific sort. And so I will talk about that uh, very shortly. Um, but for now, let's end that there.